Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? You're awake this morning. Good, good. That's awesome. All right, for, for time's sake, I usually go back and, and, and uh, kind of remind you about what we talked about. Uh, last week, Josh did an awesome job. Amen. Did he? It was good. Good teaching. Amen. Uh, and as Josh was talking about, about wives and husbands, you know, just a minute ago. How many wives do we have in, in here? Lift up your hand, wives. There's, a, there's a, some wives. How about husbands? Husbands, husbands, husbands. All right. Let me ask you a question to, to the wives, just, just to make a point here. Uh, how many wives, or, or maybe not even, you, you don't have to answer really, but does a wife, you know, that, that is married, would you like your husband, you know, to date once a month, you know, you know with somebody else? Probably not. I'm going to start something here this morning, <laughs> you know. We're going to have to uh, ask Josh to give us a, a little study on, on marriage here. And husbands, how... How many of you would like your wife to be texting somebody once a week? It's just a text. But you wouldn't like it, right? Why? Because there's something in you that is, what, jealous. Where did that come from? Did you know that, that God, let me give you a couple of scriptures. Exodus 25. The Lord is a jealous God. And how many of you know that he doesn't like you to go... Flirt around with any other gods. Go flirt around with the devil or anything. Because he's jealous. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That's why, why you wife or husband wouldn't like, you know, your spouse to go over there and, and talk to somebody else or go out with anybody else who... Who will not tolerate your affection for any, for any of the gods? He, he's not going to tolerate that. You know, neither are you wife or husbands, right? Exodus 34, 14. You must worship no other gods for the Lord whose very name is jealous. Is a God who is jealous about his relationship with you. Amen. You know, he is jealous. You are his. You know, he made you. He, he, crea you know, he created you. And he loves you. And he don't want you for the world to pull you away or the devil to pull you away. You know, everybody in here, God, actually in, in Psalms 139, you know, God made a book about you. And that book actually is saying that he's taking you, he wants to take you to heaven. You, you, your life is supposed to go to heaven. That's what God wants. But he gave us a free will. A free will. And many times people make decisions, make mistakes, make other things. And then they want to blame God. You know, God, you know, no, no, no. You know, there's a devil out there. He's, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. And, uh, you know, through what I was listening this week and stuff, uh, plowing, praying, you know, why does the devil battle with you so much to pray? Because every time you pray, you are plowing. Every time you pray, you know, you know, and that's supposed, supposed to be a lifestyle. We, we're supposed to, you know, through the scriptures, I'm going to show you here in a little bit. But in Romans 8.26... And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Guess what? Everybody is weak in an area in your life. You are weak, including myself. But that's why we give it to God in our weakness. That's why you need to pray. When you're praying in your weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. Did you know that? Sometimes, sometimes we have a list and we do all kinds of things and, and that's good. That's not bad. But there's a lot of things that we don't even see. But the Holy Spirit prays 
for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. That's why when you pray, you know, God filled you with the Holy Spirit so that you can pray in tongues. So you can pray in tongues. Because there's, there's some things that you know when you're praying. When you're praying, God is, is doing things. God is moving things around. You know, God is doing something. But when was the last time we prayed? You know, when we're in trouble or about something? No. It should, it should be a lifestyle. It should be every day. And the Father who knows all hearts. You know, you think nobody knows your heart? Yeah, the Father knows your heart. You know, maybe your wife doesn't. Maybe your husband doesn't. You know, what we're thinking or anything like that. Or we probably be in a lot of trouble. But God knows your hearts. Know, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers. How many believers we have here today? How many believers we got? See, the Spirit of God, that's why God wants you to pray. God wants you to pray. Uh, bring you in harmony with God's own will. See, God knows your will. And he, he brings you in harmony. And we know that God causes everything to work together. Aren't you glad that God, you know, even in our mistakes and everything that we do, God knows how to bring us in the right place for the, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. See, God is working through us, even in, in, through our mistakes. That's why you need to pray. And then when you really pray and get in the spirit, you, you start hearing from God. And then you start making the right decisions. And the reason many people don't make right decisions is because they don't pray. They're not hearing from God. And God is wanting you to guide you. For God know, knew his people in advance and he closed. Uh, he chose them to become like his son. God knew you from the way, the beginning. Uh, so that his son would be the firstborn. Amen. So he's the first. He, you know, he's, he's our brother. We're brothers with Jesus. So remember, when you pray, you're plowing. That's why the devil fights you so much. You're plowing. You're doing something. Uh, I always listen to, uh, to Kevin that went, went to heaven. He said that when he went there, he saw a guy that was around there. He was serving. You know, that's why a while ago when I heard Josh talking about serving, that's awesome. Angels are looking at you when you're serving. He was up there, Enoch. He said, who are you? He asked him. He says, I'm Enoch. And, and what are you doing? He said, I'm serving. <laughs> I'm serving. That's what I'm doing. Enoch lived in a time where it was bad. It was bad. But he seeked God so much that God took him to heaven. He translated him to heaven. See, but when he got to heaven and he saw him, he was serving. He was serving. And God is looking at you right now. You know, everything that we do on earth, we are going to be blessed in heaven. God is going to reward you for what you're doing here on earth. You know, and actually, he went to heaven, and God, you know what God showed him? God showed him that he only operated 30%. He said, what, God? And he made it to heaven. And somebody said, oh, boy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing only 20, you know. You know. No, you, you got to work with everything you have. And so when... When he got there, he said, oh, my God, you know, only 30% God? That's all. You know, he said, can you imagine how much more? Because you don't know how I made you. People, you were made in the image of God. There's a lot more that you can do. There's a lot more souls that we can win. There's a lot more things that we can do in the house of God. You know, bring in other people. How many people need Jesus? You know, we need a conscience in, in ourselves. Sometimes, you know, we are nothing wrong with this world. We get busy. We get working and all that. You know, that's in the soulish rim. And it's okay. God gave us that soul to enjoy it, but not to be led by it. 
That's why you are a spirit. When God speaks to you, it's through your spirit. You know, so we need to feed our spirit more than what we usually do. Because we are led by our, our soulish rim. What, what happened to, to Esau? For a, a bowl of soup, everything he had, he sold it. It was his soulish. It, it was his, his physical. It's the physical that the devil is going to continue to attack and attack and attack and attack. You know, because he lost. He lost it all. He's going to burn forever. And he's upset at you. Because you are in his place. He had it made. And now, you know, we are blessed because we have the Lord in our life. We have God in our life. And so he's going to try everything possible for you to fail. But God actually gave you everything possible for you to succeed. For us to succeed. Amen. You know, if we strive for, for the Lord. So we have to realize that. That feelings, the emotion, we can be led by that. Be led by your spirit. And if you are going to be led by your spirit, you're going to sp have to spend some time with the Lord. Spend some time in the word. You know, instead, spend some time in prayer, you know, to be able to do that. Because your, your body and your soul is ripped. It don't want anything to do with God. You know, it wants to go eat. It wants to do everything else. You know, and it's okay. God doesn't mind you enjoying it. But your job, it's okay. But your job is your mission field. That's why you should be out there talking to somebody else about the Lord. But sometimes we, we get caught up in our, in our own selfish ways. In our selfish ways. So I really believe this is the generation that I believe we are going to see the coming of the Lord. If we still allow whoever's alive. But, you know, right here, I remember, I mean, when I got saved, man, you know, it seemed like Jesus was coming back the next day. Man, I went and bought me a, bu a bus and filled it up with people, took them to church, and, you know, and, and praise God for that. Because there's some people that are, are gone. They're in heaven already. My mom, my dad, Mona's parents, and, I mean, aunts and uncles, and so many people that have gone and passed on. You know, and I said, praise God that, you know, I was able to introduce them to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Introduce them to the Lord. And that's what God wants. We don't know. Nobody knows the time and the hour. It could be one day. It could be five years. It could be 10 years. It could be 20 years. We don't know. But what if he comes tonight? Are you ready in your heart? We got to be ready. You know, what if he comes in 20 years? Will we stay busy? Actually, in Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul had to write to the people because they quit their jobs. He said, my God, Jesus is coming back. And they quit their jobs. Paul said, hey, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, keep working. And that's what God wants. You know, God wants you to stay busy. But stay also in your heart ready for, for the coming of the Lord. Amen? You know, so remember the, the ten virgins? Five were foolish, you know, and five were wise. You know, they didn't prepare the oil. That's what we need to be preparing our oil. You know, prayer for the Lord. And it's so easy. You know, as I teach here in a minute, you know, you know, it's so easy to just relax and, re, you know, like, you know, you know what the devil will tell me? Okay, you already lived for God for 41 years. Actually, we, we just separ uh, celebrated Vanessa's birthday, my daughter's birthday. A day after that we got saved. That's when we, we, we made a party for Vanessa, and we invited everybody, about 50 people, to the house. And I remember Pastor Spate prayed for all of them that night. And actually, all of them, up, up to now, they've all been saved. Praise God. That was a long time ago, you know, you know 40 years ago. You know, but the, the enemy comes, you know, uh, and he wants to steal from you. Anyways, the ten virgins, you know, you know, five were, were not ready for the coming of God. And I'm not saying he's coming right now. No, you know, it's, it's so easy. But you never know. Or you never know when you're going to leave this earth. Right? You know, we never know. So we, we got to be ready for the coming of God. Because he's going to come back and separate the sheep and the goat. And we don't want to be a goat. Amen? We want to be a sheep for the Lord. 
He's going to come as a thief in the night. You know, have you ever been broken into your house? I remember a couple of times, that, you know, uh, when I used to live by myself, you know, I got home and, man, I, I saw all kinds of things scattered. I said, man, the robbers were here. They were, they were, they were taking my stuff out, out of here. They, they, were, they were stealing from me, you know. But if, if I would have known, I would have waited for them. But I didn't know. Well, that's the way the coming of the Lord is going to be. You're not going to know. That's why we have to be ready. We have to be ready. Amen. So prayer, you know, will be able. That's why right now we're praying. There's a lot of people praying, and we need to keep praying. You know, pray in your houses. Get a, love, uh, a life of prayer. Because actually, you know, the Lord really, honestly, he would have come back already. And if he would have come back already, guess what? There's a lot of people that are not saved. But the Father in heaven loves people so much that he can delay it and delay it. You know, revelations, that should have happened. But with God, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day to God. Time is, is nothing to God. Maybe to us it is. To us. But God is putting things off. God is wanting people to get saved. God is wanting people to surrender to him. That's what God wants. Amen? Okay, let's get started here. Today's uh, study is going to be spiritual striving. Spiritual striving. Let's, let's turn to Luke 13, 24, 25, 26, and 27. Remember, remember strive. You know, another word for it, work hard. Work hard, you know. Um, let me start with the scripture here. Work hard to enter the narrow door of God's kingdom. We got to work hard. There's a narrow road also before the narrow door. You know, and the Bible says only a few will find it. There's a, actually, there's a road that is so wide that everybody's in it. But it's not narrow. And it doesn't lead here. And, and God, God is not a God that is wanting to destroy you because he, if he wanted to, he would have come back already and a lot of people would have been left behind. Would have, you know. So God loves you. God loves you. He wants us to fulfill, you know, uh, what, what he made us to do, is our purpose. Um, to God's kingdom, the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but we'll fail. We're not going to fail. Amen? We're not going to fail because God don't want you to fail. Many are going to put things off and going to drag it and do whatever. You know, actually, uh, when he went to heaven uh, and he showed him a white fence, he, he said, you know, and, he was, and Jesus was real sad. He says, my people, you know, it hurts me, he said, because they live by the, that white fence. And that white fence represented that people that wanted to say, how much can I live in the world and then be ready for Jesus to come back and cross the fence? You know, and many people live that way. How, how much can I get away with this, you know, and not this God? How, you know, how, you know how, how much can I do this? So when the master of the house has locked the door, I will be, it will be too late. You will stand, but uh, outside knocking and pleading. I remember me and Mona went to Africa. We went to Africa, you know, and uh, where we stayed, I don't know why it had first floors, uh, Second floor, three, third floor, fourth floor. But it also had first floor, you know, uh, one and a half, and then two. It had a half, you know, it, man, it, it, made, it made you confused because it looked all alike. You know, all, you know, all the floors. And I remember coming back. I said, I want to go get some things. And when I came back, I went to the wrong floor. And I was knocking. Mona, open up. Mona, open up. I said, man, I'm in Africa over here, man. And, you know, where in the world did she go? Man, 
you know, it, it was an ugly feeling. I said, man, did somebody come and steal her? Did, or where did she go? Is she left or what? Man, and I kept knocking on the door. I'm so glad nobody came and punched me in the face or something, you know. But actually, it was, it was the, the wrong door, the wrong floor. I said, oh, my God, it, it felt ugly, you know. So you don't want to catch yourself in the end times knocking on the door trying to open it and it's the wrong one and, and, and look what the Lord's going to do. Lord, open the door for us, but he will reply, I don't know you. So let's get to know the Lord. Amen. Let's start seeking God in our lives. You know, so we won't be caught that way. Where, where you come, um, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you then you will say, but we ate and we drank with you. And you taught in our streets. You know, people, I've told you before, it's not enough just to, know, to have a relationship with the Lord. You know, we, we have to really know him. I mean, we need to have a relationship with the Lord, not a position with the Lord. Okay, I, I got saved. You know, no, no. You know, it's, it's like going to a job and saying, I got hired. You know, I don't have to go back to work. Have you ever heard of that? Anybody wanted to do that? Guess what? You're not going to get paid. <laughs> well, the same thing. Well, I got saved, but, you know, there's no relationship with the Lord. We take it for granted because we call ourselves so Christian. Okay, I'm a Christian. I don't have to do nothing no more. No, no. We need to create a relationship with the Lord. And he will reply, I tell you. I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who are evil. God's going to call us evil. All right. Let me give you six, six things to strive for. Number one, uh, striving for the price. In other words, striving. In other words, you got to work hard. Work hard. Some of you work hard for your physical jobs. And you put up with it and you take it for what? For a dollar. To make, make a dollar. How much more should we strive for or work hard for our spiritual lives? For our spiritual lives. So this is a race we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 9.24. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs. All of us are running. But only one person gets the prize. Have you ever been in a race and you know that only one person is going to win? You know, and you, what do you do? Well, I'm going to win this. Have you ever been in a contest and you know, you know, uh, I'm going to win this. I'm, I'm number one. And I'm the, you know, have you ever done that? So it says, so run to win. Run to win. So as we are running in this race, we're going to run to win. All athletes are disciplined. You know, we see all the athletes and, ah, man, look what they're doing. Guess what? They're disciplined. They're disciplined. And actually, actually, the greatest love that God has is discipline, really. The greatest love is discipline. In their training, they do it to win a prize. People do it to win a prize that will fade away. How many... Trophies, trophies have we seen? You know, I, I love to, to watch Michael Jordan. I mean, he's got a lot of probably trophies. But guess what? He's older now, and, you know, there's somewhere in the shelf there. And, you know, they're nice. But, I mean, you know, he's fading away. Even those trophies are fading away, you know. But we do it, us here now... We do it for an eternal prize. Amen? They do it for a, a physical prize that's going to fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. Amen? So I run with purpose. So you're going to run with purpose. In every step, I am not just shadow boxing. It's like somebody that's, you know, boxing around and just playing around. and He's not fighting nobody. He just shadow boxing. And that's what we do, at, you know, as Christians. 
Oh, okay, we just go through the you know, motions and everything. But you got to have a relationship with the Lord. Amen? we got to have a relationship with the, with the Lord. Philippians 127, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. Did you know that you're not from here? You're, you're really a, a spirit man, really inside of you. We're just here passing through. We're living here in this life. Yeah, we got to live. We got to work. We got to do all this. We got to do all that. But, you know, really we belong to heaven. Conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it, we, we, it's all about. About Jesus Christ. Don't be, verse 28, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. There's devils out there. I've told you before. And people don't believe it. When, when, when God destroyed the world in the times of Noah, he destroyed the whole world except eight, eight people. Because they were so bad. There was so, so much sexual sin and everything that was happening in those times. You know, interbreeding with all kinds of things. I mean, they were just, it was just bad. And God said, I, I have to, this. you know, actually God himself didn't, but he allowed it through the rain. And, and, and guess what? The, uh, later on, the, the people, remember, remember the, the Tower of Babel? They were trying to get to heaven. People, there's some people that are there, are they have the wrong agreement. You gotta have the right agreement. You think sometimes you know, ask yourself how you know how how much truth or in this that I'm doing. Examine yourself, but but by God's truth, because God is true. He says, "Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are." doing they're going to be destroyed the devil's going to be destroyed the enemies but that you are going to be saved amen we are going to be saved that's what god wants you he wants to save you so we got to stay in a in a in a place momentum you know if you're going to run a race oh okay i'm going to just loaf around if you want to win that race what's going to happen you're going to be disciplined and that's what it takes. It's going to take discipline to live in this life. It's going to take discipline. You can live in this life. You can enjoy life. You can enjoy eating. You know, you can enjoy a lot of things. But do not be led by your soulish, your soul. Your soul is the one, like, my life was run by my soul, my soul for 27 years. And I went and opened nightclubs and... And dealing in drugs and all this thing. Because why? I was led by my soul. You know, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know better. But thank God, at the, right at the end of, my, of 27, going down 28, that's when the Lord came in my life. And, and, and God is so good that he'll show you exactly what you need. He is so good. God loves you. He showed me. First, the bad. He showed me the devil exactly. He said, look, all that is just bait. Everything he's using is bait to catch you. And he showed me a big old cage. He says, to catch you, and he'll destroy you, and then you're gone with him forever. But God was so loving, loving. He's, he's a, a loving God. He came and told me, but I love you. I love you. He said, but the devil wants to do this. But God will show you his goodness. And his, because I it had been three years since I had not shed a tear. I was so hard, you know, because the world taught me you got to be tough. You got to be strong. You can't cry, you know, and you got to prove yourself. And I was so hard. But when God came and showed me his goodness, and that is what he wants to show you. He's good. He's a good God, and he loves you, and he cares for you. And he showed me his goodness. He says, but I love you. You know, and he showed me his goodness, and guess what? 
Oh, my God. It broke me. It broke that hardness that I had. I said, oh, my God. Man, I started weeping and crying. And, man, I don't care if they said, man, you, you know, you're a coward. I don't care. I, I'm going to. Because God made you for you to cry, for you to weep, for you to surrender, for you to be weak. So you can be made strong in him. In him. Amen. You're strong in God. Not in yourself. In God. You are made strong. So in Ezra 4.14, I have a little grandson named Ezra. Uh, they were discouraged and frightened. And that's what the devil comes. He'll come and discourage you and, and he'll frighten you. And he works with fear. You know, that, that's why he, the devil brought that, the, the virus for all that, to bring fear. And the people that feared, you know, I mean, he was able to go beyond. Then the local residents tried to discourage and frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. What were they doing? They, they were, they were going to build a church. And they got together. And the enemy comes and he, and he wants you to stop. But like Enoch, you, you need to be serving for the Lord. You need to be helping other people. See other people what they need. Show them the love of God. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we can get real hard. And, and people say, man, is, is, if that is like, you know, living for Jesus, I don't want it. No, they want to see something different. I remember when, when Pastor Spade came around, and man, he had the love of Jesus in him. You know, and I was hard and, you know, people around me and, you know, people that I knew, you know, killed people and stuff. I said, man, you know, but Brother Spade was just, you know, hey, you know, I love you. And man, how you doing? I said, love you? Oh, man, how does this guy, you know, love another man? You know, you don't understand. You get so hard, you know, but it's the love of Jesus. Amen. And that's what the Lord wants. Uh, so number two, I didn't give you number two, right? Hindrances to the runner. Hindrances to the, to the runner. As we are going forward and striving forward, what are the things that will hinder us? Galatians 5, 7, and 8, and 9. What can hinder us? You were running the race so well. Has that ever happened to you? You're doing just a good job. You're running. You're living for the Lord so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? Who has held you back from following the truth? It could be a lot of things. It could be, you know, somebody else, another person, you know, from following the truth. Always examine yourself. How much truth is in this? This decision that I'm going to make. It certainly isn't God. And who do we blame? God. Oh, it's God. You know, God is probably holding me back. No, God is not holding you back. It isn't God. For he is the one who called you to freedom. God called you to freedom. So it wasn't God. It's not God that stops you. This false teaching back then there was a false teaching so what does that mean there's a lie the devil uses what lies lies it's like a little yeast that that spreads through the whole batch of of, of dough i am trusting the lord and keep you from believing false teaching Somebody's going to lie to you. It's going to keep you from going forward. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing you. God is going to deal with that person. That's why. Every step that you take, why don't you ask God? The Bible says, put on the full armor of God that you'll be able to withstand against the wells of the enemy. You know, <clears throat> the belt of truth. There's a belt, you know, maybe, you know, you don't have the belt on. That's why you're not living in truth the way you're supposed to. And people think, you know, God is not mocked. Listen to me. God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. 
Guess what? We live in a world. This world here is the physical. Sowing and reaping. Sowing and reaping. You know, and you're going to get what you deserve, whether it's good or whether it's bad. God is not, nobody is going to get away, you know, and going to think they trick God. You're not. That day, when, when God touched me and I had not shed a tear, <clears throat> guess what? In a matter of seconds, he showed me my life back. You know, you know, he just kind of reversed and, and I said, oh, my God, Jesus, how do you know this? Because I was there. I was there. I was there. And instead of choosing life, you, cho you chose death. Well, how did you know I did this? Well, I was there. And that's what the Lord is saying. So we, we have to be able to do that. In Nehemiah 4.11 you know, they stooped down on them. Meanwhile, the enemies were saying before they know what's happening. See, the enemy don't want you to know what's happening. They don't want you to know they exist. But they, they're going to work on you and work on you and work on you and until you give up. And you say, man, I don't want to live forgotten no more. I'm tired of this. I don't want to do this no more. It is so hard. That's what they want. We will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. The, the enemy wants to end your work, my work, what we're doing for the Lord. But we're going to press on, amen? Number three, pressing toward the goal. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. You know, hey, he, he hasn't arrived. But he's still focusing, forgetting the past. What happens? The, the enemy uses the past. You know why the enemy hurts you? Because the Bible says you, you got to forgive. If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And he knows how to come and he, he'll bring the past. And he'll hurt us. You know, and People hurt us. We hurt one another. People, every one of us done some things, and we need to repent over it. But you got to let go. You have to let go because that's the way the enemy comes in. He's looking for unforgiveness so he can come in, you know, and ma manipulate your life. And looking forward, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach to the end of the race. Are we there yet? No, we're, maybe we're not yet. But you press on. Are you running? Well, keep going so that you can see the end. I, I have a brother uh, named Richard. Uh, he, he used to, he used to uh, run the 440 one time around the field. And he has a lot of, back then they would give you ribbons. <laughs> Instead of trophies. A lot of ribbons. He had them all over the wall. He would run. He would run. And he, he, he was kind of like, like the end. But toward the middle, he would just, I mean, he was good. He would, and I remember my dad used to go with him. I used to go with him. And man, he used to, he used to scream and yell. You know, in a minute, I'm going to show you a scripture where in heaven, they're cheering us on. You know why? Because people has, loved, has lost their life over the gospel. And we don't appreciate it. We don't appreciate. We, we just take it for granted. But people have actually, the disciples lost their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have lost their life. You know, and so that's why we need to take it serious. Amen. Here's the, the Apostle Paul. So I press on, reach to the end of the race, and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through the Lord, for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ, is calling us. He's calling you and me, amen, to press on, to press on. That's why um, John came 
and one message. Repent, repent, repent. Because that's what prayer does. If you go to prayer every day, you need to repent. You know, repent of what? Because we live in this earth and you see things that actually, just like Eve saw Adam and Eve, you know, and, and, and actually they mean more to us than God. That's what happens. They, you know, every day there's a lot of things and we need to repent God. You know, God wants to unhook you. We, we, get, we get actually hooked. We get addicted to this world some way or the other. And all Jesus wants to do is unhook you from it. That's all. He wants you to be free. Amen. You know, that's why he said, do not be entangled again. Again. Because he said, I untangled you. In Proverbs 4, 7, he says, don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. Luke 9, 62. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Because that plow, people, you are plowing around you. You are praying. What is it, what is it saying? You know, when you, when you take your hand off the plow, it's because you're not praying. You're not praying. People, I know it's easy. I'm not here acting, oh, well, I'm a spiritual. No, along the years, 40 years, yeah, you know, you get on fire oh, for God, and then all of a sudden, you get cold. All of a sudden, you get lukewarm. And God said, I will spew you out of my mouth. You know, stir up the gift that is within you. Stir up the gift that is within you. Yes, God wants you to get involved in physical things, certain things. But I'm going to show you here in a minute, you know, how physical things and spiritual things. Uh, in verse 8, uh, Joshua, Joshua one seven. this is the one I wanted to give you. Be strong and cura- very courageous. Uh, be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning left or right uh, or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. It's easy to, you know, get astray. Verse 8, study the book of instruction continually. How? Continually. And how do we do it? Oh, Whenever we feel like it, when, you know, once in a while, once, in a, once a week maybe, once a month maybe, maybe once a year. Meditate on it day and night. Meditate on it, you know, be in the Word. Hey, be working. Be, you know, be your job. Be, be, you know, be driving. Hey, but be speaking in tongues as you're driving. You know, th- that's the heavenly language, you know. So you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, it says, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Amen? And that's, God wants you to prosper. God wants us to prosper, but he gave us the tools how to do it. Because there's an enemy out there there's a, that came to steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy don't want you. To be plowing. He don't want you to be praying. He don't want you to be in the word. He don't want those things. We need to, as Christians, you know, we don't want that just to be a name. I'm a Christian. But allow the oil of the Holy Spirit to be around our lives. Number four, stripping for the contest. Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses... There's a crowd of witnesses that are cheering because they want you to finish the race. They said, I gave my life for this. So finish it here. I'm giving you the baton. Keep running. Keep running. Keep running. Keep witnessing. Tell others about me. To the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slow us down, especially the sin that so easily trip us up and let us run with endurance 
the race God has set before us. God gave you this race. So you keep running this race. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Where do you want to keep your eyes? On Jesus. That's why you need that relationship. If you are, then you will be thinking about Jesus. Yeah, you can do things. You can live life. You can, but that's why the enemy attacks us with sickness. He attacks us with all kinds of things, with poverty, with everything. He takes it. We are in a war. We are in a race. Amen. So we got to continue to do that. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiated and perfects our faith. He's the one that gives us the faith. He's the one that helps us. And he sent the Holy Spirit with us. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Because he saw. Why did he endure such pain, the cross, your sins and all that? Why? Because he saw ahead. He saw ahead that, that we're going on. We're, we're keeping on. He saw that. Awaiting him. He endured the cross. Disregarding its shame. Was it shameful? Yeah, it was. But to him, he said, hey, I don't care. I'm going to endure this cross for my people. Because he wants you, all of us, back to the Father. Because the Father wants us back. Amen? He wants us in heaven. That's what he wants. And that's why it is delayed. I know that people, you know, you know are talking about the Antichrist. And all. I, I can care less about the Antichrist. We need to give witness for the Lord. Amen? We need to be on fire for Jesus so that he can use us. Amen? Because there's a lot of people that need to come to the Lord, need to come to Jesus. He endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of the honor beside God's throne. He is up there. There's a throne up there. Uh, let me give you number five so we can finish this. Five and six. Uh, the home stretch, 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought, here's Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Praise God. One, one day you're going to be able to say, oh, man, I finished the race. But you keep on. You keep on. And I have remained faithful. I have remained faithful. That's why you cannot allow your soul, your emotions, your feelings, and do whatever. You can't. They're going to get you into a lot of trouble. What happened to Samson? You know, the enemy knew exactly what to bring to him. Delilah, you know, hey, here, here. Oh, no, no, no. You know, he wasn't supposed to cut his hair, drink any liquor, see any, anything, any dead bodies around him. And the enemy just knew. And he knows how to get you. 2 Corinthians 10.4 we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons. Remember, it's God's weapons to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arg arguments. The Bible says, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Anything that wants to exalt itself above, above God, we need to cast it down. We need to be ready. And the last one is the, the, the prize won. One of these days, we're going to say, here it is. 2 Timothy 4.8. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. Amen? People, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. You know, stay in the race. And the prize is not just for me. But for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And how do we do that? That's why we need a relationship with God. Because this life, we, we, are, we, we need to live in this earth. But this life is temporal. This life is temporal. And God is so good that he's, he's so nice to you that he said, you, you can enjoy it. Even though it's temporal. You know, but do not 
Get lost. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, your mind, your cells, your emotion, your body, it don't want nothing to do with God. It, right now, it's thinking what it's going to go eat right now, after here. I'm, you know, some of you are thinking that. But, uh, I don't know. In fact, you're probably arguing with your spouse. No, we should go over here. No, I want to go here. You know? Because we know our body controls us, or our emotions control us. You know, you know. I wish Pastor would just hurry up and you know finish because you know we gotta go. You know, we gotta go eat. You know, that, that's your soulish person talking to you. <laughs> Let's stand together. Let's stand and lift up our hands to the Lord. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless you. We thank you, God. Thank you, Spirit of the Living God. Steer us up, God. In Jesus' mighty name, God. Father, right now, allow the Spirit of God to be, God, stir up, quicken us, God. Fill us with your power, with the Holy Ghost, God. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just command the enemy right now to let go of your people in Jesus' name. Father, we have the name that's above every name, God, right now. In the name of Jesus. Let your glory, God, just fall upon us, God. God, let your power, let your spirit of God just speak to us. Speak to our hearts, God. Let our hearts get soft, Jesus. Stir up, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, right now, Father, let us have that good ground. Father, we may have a lot of things in our heart, God, that the enemy will come and, and confuse us and stir us up. Father, I come against confusion right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I speak life in the name of Jesus. I speak healing, God. Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God. By the power of God. Thank you, Jesus. Give us a desire, God. A desire to seek you. A desire to pray, God. Even in our houses, God. A desire to read the word. Meditate on the word day and night, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, God. A desire, God, to seek you. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we thank you, God. Father, right now, anybody that needs Jesus in your heart, you've been away from the Lord, you need Jesus. The first step is to repent and say, Jesus, I'm sorry what I've done. God, come into my life. Come into my heart. Everywhere I go, if I have an opportunity, if I see somebody that needs Jesus or needs to come back, I go speak to them because God gave me a revelation of of, of hell, a, a man, it, it, it's tormenting out there. I mean, to be out there and be lost when Jesus meant for you to go to heaven. But Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, steer us up, God. Steer us up. Give us a conscience for other people, God, for other souls, God, for other souls, God, that need you just the way we need you, God. Thank you, God. Help us, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Touch the people of God this morning. God, fill them with your power. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, let the fire of the Holy Spirit come upon you. Let the fire of the Spirit of God come upon you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Father, we come against confusion. Father, fear, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God, for the power of God. You came to give us life and life more abundantly in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, God. Use us, God. Use our gifts, God, to serve one another, God. To serve others, God. To serve in your kingdom, God. God, let our jobs, God, be our mission field, God. God, that we can talk to others, God, about you. That they need you, Jesus. They need you in your life, God. We thank you, Jesus. We give you praise and honor and glory. Let's give the Lord praise this morning. Let's give him a hand of applause. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.